Hello, everyone, and welcome to week 17 of MSK Unknown Case Series. We have a phenomenal case, uh, one that's extremely educational. But before I begin, please, please subscribe to the channel. Please support our mission in uh, making free knowledge go viral throughout the world and helping other individuals learn radiology. OK, so let's take a look at this case. This is a frontal view of the left humerus. And what we're noticing is obviously a lucent lesion along the distal humeral metadiaphysis. And the question that I have for you guys is, what's the most worrisome feature of this lesion? Is it periosteal reaction, soft tissue mass, endosteal scalloping, or wide zone of transition? What's the most worrisome feature of this lesion? And I'll give you a couple seconds to ponder about that. And of course, the answer here is none other than endosteal scalloping. Notice that the cortex is made up of an outer layer of periosteum and an inner layer of endosteum. And if you notice, this lesion is scalloping the endosteum or the inner layer of the cortex. Notice that the inner layer is not well defined here. And it's, a, you know, it's, it's, you know, erasing part of that inner endosteal cortex here. So that is the answer here. There's no periosteal reaction associated with this mass. We don't see any soft tissue mass you know, associated with this, you know, osseous lesion. And there's not a wide zone of transition. In fact, there's a narrow zone of transition, which we'll discuss a little later, but it's very well defined. We can literally take a pencil and outline the contours of this lesion. Okay, so endosteal scalloping is the answer here. I want to take a minute to talk about how we evaluate bone lesion. And that's the purpose of this case. The purpose of this case is not really to identify a final diagnosis, but really to get you to evaluate a bone lesion appropriately, because I think many, many residents struggle with this. So I want to take this opportunity to tell you how I evaluate a bone lesion. The first thing, obviously, is location, right? We have to know where it is, right? So for example, if, if there's a lesion that's in a specific location in a bone, for example, the intratrochanteric region of the femur, we're going to, we may consider some diagnosis that we may otherwise not consider. For example, a liposclerosing myxofibrous tumor happens very commonly at the intratrochanteric region. In fact, like up to 70 to 90% of those type of lesions occur in the intratrochanteric femur, right? So location is very important. Location within a long bone is also important. So whether it's, you know, diaphyseal, metaphyseal, or even epiphyseal. So for example, an epiphyseal lesion, uh, you know, we tip, if we see a lucent or a osteolytic or radiolucent lesion in the epiphysis, we usually think about the characteristic differential of four things, right? So a chondroblastoma, especially in a child, eosinophic granuloma, subacute osteomyelitis in the form of, of a Brody's abscess or a giant cell tumor. Those are the four things that we characteristically see in the epiphysis. So the location is very key. If, if a lesion is diaphyseal or metaphyseal, like in our case, metadiaphyseal, you know, that may not necessarily be as helpful in narrowing the differential, but it can sometimes be helpful in ruling out certain things. Is the lesion solitary or multifocal? Obviously, if we see multiple lucent lesions or multiple lytic lesions, we may consider the diagnosis of a metastasis or you know, myeloma or lymphoma, something like that, right? If it's solitary, we may consider other entities. So you know, that is an important question that you should always ask. And then these words matrix mineralization get tossed around a lot in talking about osseous lesions or bone lesions, but very few people really understand what they mean. So the matrix is what type of material is being produced by the lesion itself. So for example, a bone lesion like an osteosarcoma, which is a malignant bone tumor, it produces bone. So there's osseous matrix, right? In the form of fluffy amorphous kind of density or calcification. Chondroid tumors produce cartilage. So the matrix is, you know, rings and arcs matrix, right? That's what we usually talk about. Fibrous lesions produce fibrous tissue, right? And it usually is ground glass material or ground glass appearance on radiography. When we say mineralization, that's the calcification associated with the lesion. So when we talk about matrix mineralization, we're talking about the material that's being produced by the tumor. And is there any calcification associated with that lesion? So I want that to be very clear to everyone. And I think a lot of residents struggle with that concept of what we actually mean by matrix and mineralization. This is a very important event. Is it narrow or wide zone of transition? This may be the most important feature to evaluate if something is going to eventually be benign or eventually be malignant. So oftentimes we can't tell, but sometimes it can suggest a specific diagnosis. So something that is has a narrow zone of transition, like in our index case, 
it's very well defined. You can literally take a pencil or a pen and outline the margins of the lesion, right? That's what we mean by a narrow zone of transition. That usually is seen in benign entities. If something has a wide zone of transition, you can't quite outline where the lesion is starting, where it's ending. The borders or the margins are a bit obscure and that favors more of an aggressive process, okay? So very important to understand the difference between a narrow zone and a wide zone of transition. Is there periosteal reaction? In our case, there was not periosteal reaction, but is it benign or is it aggressive periosteal reaction? And that will make you think about certain entities. So benign periosteal reaction is usually solid, you know, well-defined periosteal reaction. Aggressive can be, you know, sunburst type that we sometimes see in Ewing sarcoma or like a Codman's triangle where, you know, there's periosteal reaction that's, you know, lifting the periosteum so much that the bone doesn't have enough time to form normal, you know, periosteal bone, right? Periosteal new bone. So that's very aggressive. That's seen often in osteosarcomas. Uh, some aggressive types of osteos, uh, a periosteal reaction can also be seen in benign things like osteomyelitis. So, you know, we typically call it benign or aggressive. It's not always possible to tell if something is benign or malignant solely on the periosteal reaction, but it's an important thing to consider when you're evaluating a bone lesion. The size is also important, right? If it's like two centimeters versus 11 centimeters, that can make a difference in swaying you towards a specific uh, diagnosis. Also, for lesions that look similar, like for example, an osteoblastoma versus an osteoblastoma, they can look very similar and the size usually is the difference. So if, if it's less than two centimeters, we typically call it an osteoblastoma. If it's more than two centimeters, we call it an osteoblastoma, a lesion that looks very similar. So, you know, these are sort of the seven things that I consider when I'm evaluating a bone lesion. It can be very helpful in sort of tailoring your differential diagnosis. Now in our index case, we need to know a little bit more about the patient, right? And we, I told you nothing about the patient. Is this patient 17 years old? Is this patient 67 years old, right? That's gonna change the differential significantly, right? If this patient is like 17, 23, 24, we're gonna think about more benign things like you know a solitary bone cyst, maybe an aneurysmal bone cyst, an intraosseous lipoma. Could this be a focus of fibrous dysplasia? All benign entities, right? But if this patient is 67 years old, they're coming in, they have pain, they have this lesion, Although it's you know pretty well defined narrow zone of transition, there is some endoscopic scalloping. We may consider more malignant or aggressive entities like metastases, multiple myeloma, lymphoma. You know some of these things, right? So the age really makes a difference in you know deciding what path you want to go down for your differential diagnosis. So I think I can't state that enough. We have to know a patient's age, and we have to correlate what we see you know radiographically with the clinical picture. Now this ended up being eosinophilic granuloma. Uh, I wasn't expecting you to know this. You know, this was actually, I didn't know this when I looked at it, we biopsied this and it came back eosinophilic granuloma. But the purpose of this is really to evaluate or how to evaluate bone lesions. But since this was EG, I wanna talk about EG very briefly. It's malignant proliferation of Langerhans cells, okay? Uh, it usually affects flat bones, but in this case, you know, it, it affected a long bone as it can, or the spine. Sometimes when you get the vertebral plana appearance and the spine are a completely collapsed vertebral body, that's one of the manifestations of EG or eosinophilic granuloma. And remember, in this case, it was metadiaphyseal, but I told you that one of the differentials for epiphyseal lesions is EG. So, you know, it can certainly happen in the epiphysis of a long bone as well. The vast majority of these occur in young people. So 85% of them occur in patients that are less than 30 years of age. Our patient was, I think, 37 years of age. It can happen in anyone. I mean, it, it can happen in 70 year olds, you know, quite frankly. But, you know, the vast majority do occur in patients that are younger. It usually has a lytic or radiolucent appearance. It can have some aggressive features. There can be a soft tissue mass. There can be aggressive periosteal reaction associated with, with the lesion as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to appear the way I showed it to you on today's radiograph. Um, you can have cortical destruction, you know, very aggressive features that may, you know, make figuring what this out very confusing. And that's why ultimately sometimes we have to biopsy some of these lesions. But more commonly, you know, the more mature lesions appear less aggressive with time. There's usually no soft tissue mass. There may or may not be periosteal reaction, but you know, with time, it appears less and less aggressive usually. Not always, but usually. And the treatment is very variable for this. Sometimes you can just observe these and watch these and they can just completely regress with time. Other times you may have to do some you know, bone grafting and curettage. You may even have to give chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Uh, sometimes surgery is also needed. So it's extremely variable. It depends on the patient, what it looks like, uh, if there's systemic symptoms, you know, there's all sorts of 
uh, decisions that need to be made with a multidisciplinary approach to figure out how to treat this effectively. So I hope this was helpful in delineating what EEG is, but more importantly, how we evaluate osseous bone lesions. Tune in next week again for another super high yield case. I can't wait to show you another great case, hopefully for the core exam. Thank you so much for your time.